Hello, I'm Dr. David Baskin. I'm the Professor, Vice Chairman, and Program Director at Houston Methodist Department of Neurosurgery. And today I'm going to talk to you about endoscopic transphenoidal surgery. I've had the good fortune to operate on over 5,000 patients, and I wanted to talk to you about a few tricks of the trade that I've learned along the way. So you all know that uh, endoscopic skull-based surgery is exploding. Uh, not only can we do pituitary surgery, but we can reach all the way to the frontal sinus to the spinal cord through the nose. But I'm going to limit my discussion today primarily to just uh, pituitary surgery. But many of the techniques and discussions that I will use here apply uh, to the much wider uh, range of, of operations that can be performed endonasally. So in general, uh, the, my philosophy for these procedures is to preserve the nose. A lot of people resect the turbinates. I find if you do that, you have a lot of more nasal problems postoperatively. Expose the cavernous sinuses. Always expose cavernous sinus to cavernous sinus, and I'm going to show you examples of that. You can use a Doppler to make sure you're over the carotids extradurally so you have the exposure you need. You really want to expose from the horizontal portion of the floor to the tuberculum so you can see the inferior and superior circular sinuses. Uh, you want to remember that the cavernous sinuses have multiple compartments. And this is an interesting thing. When I started my training, nobody ever went into the cavernous sinus. It was no man's land, no woman's land. Now, we routinely go into the cavernous sinus because it's not one big vein. There's little compartments. You can always stop the bleeding with flow seal or other hemostatic equivalents. And that's been a big change in the surgery. Fat is your friend in terms of reconstruction of the skull base. And a tight seal can usually be done without a nasal septal flap, which avoids a lot of post-operative nasal discomfort. We have incredible tools. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, but I want to just show you this. We now have the Oculus Rift helmet, the surgical theater 3D virtual reality, and now we routinely rehearse the surgery by walking through the brain or flying through the brain and getting a much better idea of where the tumor is in relationship to the uh, optic nerves and chiasm, which are in yellow, and the carotid arteries. And it really has changed the way I do surgery because now you can, in your mind, visualize where is the tumor, where is it lateral to the carotid, where is it medial to the carotid. You can see it pooching out laterally on the one side. And so this is one of many advances in the field, including the high resolution of the endoscopic uh, technique and, in general, neural navigation, which I use in every case. So. Um, Another big advance, at least for me, is I tend to have a practice with very large tumors. How do you get the tumors down? You don't want to pull because you can pull something out with it that you, want, you don't want to touch. Uh, but I find if you put a lumbar drain and inject fluid into the CSF pathways, you can increase the intracranial pressure and push the tumor down to you very much like a woman bearing down to deliver a baby. And I've had tumors up into the ventricles come down and deliver themselves with this technique. And I'll show you a video of that. Well, I do work with ENT on the complex cases. On simple cases, I do this using the Mataka arm, which is this robotic arm that holds the endoscope in place and really uh, gives you a third hand during surgery. Um, so I divide the surgery into the nasal portion and the intracranial portion. And the nasal portion is really quite simple. Uh, and I think even if you're going to work routinely with an ENT surgeon, which is fine, you should understand the basic anatomy. And it's not that complex. There's basically three things in the nose to worry about. There's the inferior turbinate, there's the middle turbinate, and the superior turbinate. And if you reflect the inferior turbinate and middle turbinate over, you will find the sphenoid osteum at the base of the superior turbinate. So here we go. We're going to reflect the inferior turbinate over. And by the way, that's a procedure that's done by ENT to just increase airflow. And if you reflect the inferior turbinate over, you can leave it. And the patients will almost always tell you, hey, doc, I'm breathing a lot better. Then reflect the middle turbinate over, as you see on the right-hand side of the slide. And you'll see that little hole. And that's the sphenoid sinus osteum. This takes about three minutes to get here. It's not complicated. Any neurosurgeon can do this and learn how to do this very easily. Once you get there, you want to open up the mucosa a little bit so you can see the sphenoid sinus osteum and the rostrum of the sphenoid sinus. There's a number of different ways to do this. You can use a microdebrider. You can use a, a, a bovi, which I do here. Uh, but in any event, what you'll end up with is something like on the right-hand side where you can see both sphenoid sinus osteums. You'll separate the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and the nasal septum and rotate it over so that you're looking at this thing that looks almost like a, a, a cow skull you know, two eyes and a nose. And that's what it looks like in real life. 
then very simply, you simply open up. You take a Middleton rongeur, which is kind of a strong rongeur, put it in each sphenoid sinus osteum, open it up, take a punch, open up the sphenoid sinus, and you're going to have a view like this. This is a great view. This is the view you want to have every time. You can see the cella, the cellar floor. To the right, you see the carotid tubercles. To the uh, uh, superior, you see the optical carotid recesses. And then you see the optic uh, struts and the planum sphenoidale. If you can see this every time, it will orient you 100% of the time. One of the biggest mistakes done in transphenoidal surgery is people don't make a full exposure and then they get off and they get into misadventures. So here's a little a, a video oh, just showing you the entry into the cellar. So I'm, I'm, I've been through the nose. I'm going to now drill the cellar floor. I use a high-speed diamond burr. I define an epidural plane and then I'm going to use a punch and open the cellar floor. Now you can see in this video that usually with big tumors the floor is very thin Sometimes it's thick and you have to drill it more, but usually you don't. Now, here's the first really important part of the exposure. You really need to expose the cavernous sinuses. As you can see me over the cavernous sinus and really over the extradural portion of the carotid. If you're careful and gentle, you can get that kind of exposure every time, and you can see cavernous sinuses on both sides. You want to see the horizontal portion of the floor to the tuberculum. We coagulate the dura, start by opening the dura in the midline, and generally, in most cases, the tumor is soft and will be easily removed. So, cavernous sinus to cavernous sinus, horizontal portion of the floor to the tuberculum celli, expose extra drilly over the carotids, use a Doppler probe, know where you are, and you will avoid misadventures. Now the tumor resection. Obviously, you want to find the tumor and dissect it away from the normal gland, and that's fairly straightforward in most cases. Uh, you can see me now opening the dura more widely beginning with a central dural opening and then working out laterally and then as you core the tumor you want to reach out you start by just making some room in the center and then reach out to the sides and get the tumor to come away from the cavernous sinus walls uh, slowly and so you can see you can use various instruments to remove the tumor sometimes the tumor is very soupy and suction is the best way to remove it sometimes micropituitary rongeurs are the best way and sometimes these ring curettes which you see me using here are your friends so you kind of work on this and you'll see that as you begin to remove it, you want to open your door more, more widely and here comes a big piece of tumor out. The more widely you open the door, you're, the better off you are. And in the end of the day, you want to see the medial walls of the cavernous sinus intradurally. Now, what about a really big tumor that's stuck? You're trying to pull on it and it doesn't come. Inject through the lumbar drain. So here's a tumor that's stuck. I can't seem to get it to come down. I'm going to start to inject uh, fluid into the lumbar drain, and here's the baseline picture, and then here's 5 cc's being injected, and then 10 cc's, and you're going to see how that just pushes the tumor down to you like a woman bearing down to deliver a baby, and this enables you to get extraordinarily large supercellar extensions out through the basic exposure without having to do a transplantum exposure and all that sort of thing. Now 20 cc's is injected, and you can see the capsule, uh, and you can see how I can get lots of tumor out. And now, if you want to look back, take the CSF out. Look at that. It's like an accordion. The CSF capsule goes back up. So you can inject and withdraw, inspect the cella, and get the entire capsule to evert into the cella. And the cue is to make sure it's all the way down on both sides. And when it is, it's a very obvious appearance. We're not going to talk too much about this, but you know, you can look up into the supercellar cistern. You can see here now the optic chiasm and the two optic nerves coming together. The, the view with the endoscopes is incredible because it has such a wide field of view. And you can use 60 degree endoscopes, 45 degree endoscopes, and very easily now see the intracranial portion of the carotid. You can even see the carotid bifurcation. So it's absolutely incredible. And you can see here the stalk the vessels of the pituitary stalk, which are compressed against the posterior arachnoid. So the, the visualization is unbelievable. It's much better than with the microscope because you have so much more of a wide field of view. And then the reconstruction. So as I told you, yes, a nasal septal flap is sometimes helpful and needed, but most of the time it's not needed. If you use fat and then some sort of an implant that you can place intradurally and tissue glue, 
that usually does the job. So here's an example of a patient, big tumor, has a little bit of a CSF leak. You can see the cavity. I've harvested a fairly good sized piece of fat. I want to fill the whole cavity, place it intradurally. This is a MedPore implant, which is a polypropylene implant, which bone will grow through. And you can see I'm sort of snapping it in like a gasket seal, making sure that it's all intradurally, so it's holding the whole thing in like a tight sling. And then after that, I'm going to put some tissue sealant on it. And really, pretty big CSF leaks can be very successfully repaired without a nasal septal flap, with all the nasal, without all the nasal crusting and discomfort that occurs for up to three months after surgery. Now, occasionally you need them, but many times you don't. So the cavernous sinus, as I said, is a new frontier. When I was trained, you didn't go into it, but now and you can see different types of tumors. The tumor on the left is easy. The tumor in the middle invades into the cavernous sinus up to the intracarotid line. You can now almost always go into the cavernous sinus and get that tumor out. And remember that the cavernous sinus has little pockets. So when you get bleeding, you just put a little flow seal or surgery cell powder, it will stop and you go on. And the tumor on the right might be a little bit more advanced, but unless you're all the way out lateral to the cranial nerves, you can actually look around the carotid and get that part too. So here's an example of a patient where you look at this, you say, oh my God, this is terrible cavernous sinus invasion. I'm never going to be able to get it out. Here's what it looks like in surgery. You can see the cell essentially and the wide exposure of the cavernous sinus on the right. But with just a little bit work, look what happens. You can see the carotid uh, very easily in the, in, in the middle of the cavernous sinus. You can see the medial compartment. And you can see the lateral compartment. So with just a little patience and flow seal, you, we, we, the cavernous sinus is no longer a, a no man or no woman's land unless, unless you get far out laterally where the cranial nerves are. So here's an example of working lateral to the carotid. You can see the carotid on the right-hand side, and you can see a pocket in the cavernous sinus posteriorly behind the carotid. The carotid's pulsating there, and you can see me reach underneath the carotid, on top of the carotid, and pull out tumor in the cavernous sinus. And there's a little bit of oozing, but most of the oozing has already been stopped with flow seal. So the cavernous sinus is really no longer uh, a, a taboo, and therefore our resections are so much better than they've ever been before. So I guess in summary, don't be afraid of the nose. Uh, you can do more than you think. Nasal anatomy is fairly straightforward. Uh, craniotomy is kind of passe for most uh, pituitary tumors, uh, unless there's extraordinarily lateral, extraordinary lateral extension. And even then, if you can decompress the cellular and supercellular component, you can argue you're never going to get all the lateral tumor out anyway, and you can do your ADL surgery. So, Really, uh, all of our technology has revolutionized the field, changed the way we think about pituitary tumors, and this now really sh can and should be in the armamentarium of any neurosurgeon who does intracranial surgery. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. We have a wonderful brain tumor center. This is our website. Please come and visit us. We have a number of videos about how to do the surgery and all sorts of other research, and thank you very much for your attention, and I appreciate the privilege to talk with you.